All right, my friends, how are you doing today? How do you like these keys? Good. Yeah. I think it was about seven years ago or something like that. Anna and, and I and John and James and Grandma and Grandpa, Mom and Dad, went to Ensenada. And uh, I want to say that when we went to, well, it was Rosarito, Rosarito. And uh, I want to say that the hotel gave us, says, here's your key to your room. <laughs> but uh, actually, that's not the case. But I found these keys, and they're awesome. There's four keys on here. And the first thing I thought of is a couple texts in the Bible. Turn with me real quickly to Revelation. You have your Bibles with you? In the state of my voice and all this post-nasal drip, we'll see how long this actually is. Because if I start coughing, it may be the end of the sermon. So, uh, but we're going to go to Revelation chapter 1. Revelation chapter 1. Just before, remember last week was about the Laodicean dance. You remember that? I was in the same area of the Bible. And, uh, but I'd like you to uh, quickly listen to what Jesus said in chapter 1. I'm going to start with verse 17. And this was just after John had gone into vision. He saw Jesus, but this Jesus looked more like Gandalf from Lord of the Rings. He had a long white beard, you know, kind of odd too. He had eyes with flame coming out of them. That's kind of cool. It's like Marvel or something, you know. And then out of his mouth came something. Does anyone know what it is? What came out of his mouth in Revelation? A sword comes out of his mouth. Now, sometimes I say, does it shoot like this? Or does he go like this and do like, and it comes out and he pulls it out like this? I don't know. But what I do know is the sword comes from here because the word of God is power and strength. And then this guy named John, which is an apostle who was getting this vision, he sees him. And he fell down at the feet of Jesus as if he was dead, it says. He said, fell down. I'm like, I'm gone. And then the tap on the shoulder happens of the right hand. And the words of Jesus say to him, be not what? Afraid. Fear. Fear. Not. That's the Yoda way of saying it. Fear, you will not, right? So, he says, do not be afraid. I am the what? First and the last. I am the living one. That's very powerful. I'm the living one. But something had happened to him. At the cross, he died. But then, death was destroyed, and he holds a key, a cool-looking key, one that's more powerful than this world can give. He says, I was dead, and now look, behold, I am living forever and ever, and I hold the keys to hell and what? Death. This week's message is called Operation Hellbreak. Kind of hellbreak. You go, what, what in the world kind of a, what kind of a title is that? Well, you've seen those prison break movies like Alcatraz back in the 70s. Maybe in 2012 or something, there was like a, even a space prison that somebody broke out of, right? All these different prison breaks. 
It's in our nature to not want to be held behind by chains that hold us down. But we have found ourselves as human beings because of decisions that our parents, our real parents, Adam and Eve, made. And we are stuck in death. And yes, the word says Hades, but the H-E double hockey sticks, the hell that sometimes we are in. And you know this, I know this, as we are disconnected from God in our lives, as we make decisions that hurt ourselves, we live in our own personal hells. But Christ holds the key to that hell to break us out. He is not the warden of the prison, but he's someone that breaks us out of the prison. Though he owns it, but the devil took it over, right? He knows the combination of how to get out of it. Turn with me in your Bibles to another text where we deal with this, where this is a powerful one. And I know you've heard this many times in perhaps sermons or messages, but I'd like you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 17. Actually, chapter 16, sorry, forgive me. And we're going to start about at uh, verse 13. This week I did not put together anything on the keynote because, uh, frankly, I did not have time. So, <laughs> so, so there we are. But Caesarea Philippi, if you've ever gone with us to Israel, we always go to Caesarea Philippi where you have this place called the Banias. And you go, and it's a beautiful location. It's actually where the woman who was healed, remember the woman for 12 years? She had had bleeding. And she came to Capernaum from Caesarea, Philippi, to Capernaum, and she touched the hem of his garment. Remember that? And she was healed. Bang. Well, this was a place of worship of many gods, especially the god Pan. These gods were uh, quite ancient, and they had their sexual elements to them, Pan did. And there was hence much prostitution in the area. But Jesus, with the disciples, were heading through here because it was not only a rich area, but also because it was on the way to Mount Hermon. You know Mount Hermon if you're from, from uh, Lebanon. Mount Hermon is a beautiful mountain that... Uh, is the place where the transfiguration happened. And Jesus was heading there. Give me a second. There, now it's dry. Very good. Forgive me. Doing a little advertisement there for tea. <laughs> Emil, thank you for staying on me. He says, Pastor, you put it there. It might be knocked over. I said, thank you. I put it there instead. Is that better? All right, perfect. So, uh, Excellent. So he's heading through Caesarea Philippi. And uh, when he came to this region, he sits down with the apostles. And he has a moment of contemplation. He says, who do people say that I am? Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Notice he's referring to himself in the third person. They replied, some say John the Baptist. Now, in the chapter, uh, uh, two chapters previous, John the Baptist had been executed by Herod, Antipas. His head had been removed from his body, and his disciples then buried his body missing the head. And there was a lot of sadness, and Jesus had been baptized by John the Baptist. But because John was gone and now another preacher, some say maybe John the Baptist is still alive. You know how that goes. You know, it's urban legend, right? He's still about. 
He's someone else walking through the desert, yelling at people and telling people to straighten up. So there's Jesus. Some say John the Baptist. Others say what? Elijah. And still others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Someone from the past. And he says, okay, that's great. Who do people say I am? But what about you, Jesus says? Are you in verse 15? You with me? Matthew chapter 16, verse 15. What about you? What do you say that I am? Peter. Peter is the guy who always allowed his mouth to run off. Are there any Peters among us? The ones without the filter? But sometimes it's okay to have no filter when it's truth. But they're the ones you don't want talking at constituency or something. Uh, you know what I mean? They're the ones that you don't want necessarily saying stuff. Because he might say something that makes you uncomfortable. Or whatever. Peter immediately stands up with a truth that the other ones didn't want to say. They were too afraid to say it. Give me a moment. <coughs> Immediately, Peter stands up. You are Messiah. You know what Messiah means? Mashiach in Hebrew is translated into Christos in Greek. It means the anointed one. The one who has been officially locked in as the leader. Okay, that's what it means. God has ordained him. You are Messiah. You're the son of the living God. They were there in a place where there was worship in Caesarea Philippi, surrounded by worship of dead gods. Pan, Zeus, all these different gods, Diana, well, Aphrodite's in their culture. All of these different gods are around, but they're dead. You can see Zeus standing there, but he's made out of stone. His eyes are there, but they can't see. His ears are there, but he cannot listen. His mouth is there. He cannot speak. I'm quoting from Psalms right now. Their throat is there, but they cannot utter a word. How many of us have many gods in our lives that are just like that? It says in the book of Psalms, they who follow those gods will be like them. Meaning, if your God has no heart for people, then you will have no heart for people. If your God does not see the needs, then you will not see the needs. D does that make sense? Are you with me? All right. So, Peter calls him the what? Messiah the li living God, the son of the living God, not the dead God. He is alive. Jesus replied, blessed are you, baracha, right? Barak, you know that, to bless, baracha, son of Simon, son of Yon, or Yonah, John. For this was not revealed to you by flesh or blood, but it was revealed to you by our Father in heaven. And I tell you, verse 18, are you with me? That you are what? Now, his name was Simon before, right? But there's a lot of Simons. 
It's almost like, uh, you know, in our family, it's like that. Now, my dad now has passed away. But when you say John, it's hard because there was dad, me, my son. John, what? So that way you say grandpa. You say John. You say JD. That's how we did it. So you could say different names so that we would answer to them. But you say Simon, everybody says what? So Jesus says, you are Petros. You know what Petros means? Rock. Well, Petra is like a, yeah, I heard it. Gemma, is that you, Gemma? Petra is your sister's name. Petra is the big rock. By the way, it's feminine. Did you know that? In Hebrew and even in Greek, when it's feminine, that means it's bigger. Don't go to any, uh, uh, all right. So. <laughs> That's same thing in the Hebrew. You get that biha is like a, a, a land animal, like a cow. But you say biha moth, and that means a gigantic land animal, like a brachiosaurus. Okay, so, so they ask, that's how it works linguistically. <coughs> Petros is a stone, like a, you could say pebble, but no, a stone. You know, you pick it up on the ground. But listen carefully what Jesus says, because he plays with these words. He says, you are Petros, but and on this rock, by the way, the word and can be but also in the ancient world. On this Petra. So he didn't name him personally, but he named what he was saying. You are Peter. And on this big Peter, this big rock, I will build my what? Ecclesia. Now that one in Spanish, you know that. Ecclesia, right? Inglesia, it's like that. But it comes from the Greek ecclesia. You know what ecclesia means? Yes, but there's another definition and they would use it in the ancient Greek. When there was a voting time to come. I know we're in the middle of a voting time, right? If there's a Congress, an assembly of people all together, that is ecclesia. Like in Hebrew, well, in Greek also the word synago or synagogue, where everyone comes together. Out of this gathering, I, this is out of this rock, I will build my ecclesia, my people from all nations kindred, tongue, and people, I will bring these people together to be one people, ecclesia, my church. Because the reason why I say that is we think of churches as like a building. See this building? Look her up. See there? It's really cool. I like the construction of this place. Actually, it reminds me. You know this church, if you turned it upside down, it kind of be like a boat. Ever notice that? It's kind of cool, wouldn't it? You turn it upside down. I got a sermon coming up called All in One Boat. Take the church and turn it upside down when the flood comes, right? You float in it. Only problem is you hope you have a top on there, right? But the thing is, is we think of church as a building. But you know, this crude matter here, this stuff can go away. All of these things, the carpeting, can be torn up one day because someone spilled too much whatever on it. So now you've got to get rid of it and you've got to put a new one. These planks of wood, which make this beautiful building, can be eaten by termites. Time will eat away. And one day a wrecking ball will come right through the building. And I would hope that the generation, when that happens, would build one 
more strong than the past. I would hope that until Jesus. Now, if Jesus comes again, I don't care anymore, right? I couldn't care less. I actually, I try to build, whenever we do construction, I try to say, okay, can it last until Jesus comes again? And then all bets are off. I don't care. Use it. Have fun with it. God, play golf with it. Off it goes. Goodbye. I don't care about the building if he comes again. But until he comes again, I want people to meet in that, the church to meet. Okay? Okay, here we go. Got the little kid thing. Here is the church. Here's the steeple. Open the doors and woo, woo. Where's the people? Kind of feels like that at church sometimes, huh? Especially after COVID. Nobody coming back to church anymore. All it takes is cutting of online, the, the internet, and all of a sudden now there's no more church anymore. Done. But the real church is like this. Here's the church, here's the steeple. Oh, oh, wait, wait. There's the church, there's the people. Right? I'm sorry, I, you guys online, I'm weird, but there's people, those are people. They look like fingers, but they, they're real. So, um, and each one of them has a personality, and they don't all look the same as my fingers. Right? We all. The ecclesia. But what's that great rock that he mentioned? Let's go back. What is that rock that not Petro, because I'll tell you, Catholicism and the Catholic Church has built a theology about Peter being the first pope there. The only problem is, is Peter was married. That's, that's a difficulty in Catholicism, you know, because that just, it just got into complicated things. Jesus was not calling Peter the first pope. Jesus was calling Peter the one who said, the Petra, you are the Messiah, right? The son of the living God. And on this rock, I will build my people, church. And let's keep reading, because this is the part. Because we as Seventh-day Adventists, don't take this to heart. We just get into this very thought-provoking religion at times. And I know why, because I, you know, I'm doing theology. I'm talking about all these languages and stuff. Don't let that, don't let that trick you into getting a head religion. It's an action religion, okay? I know sometimes we warm pews. Sometimes we have to warm it on more than on other days, right? When it's cold outside. But in the end, if we're just warming pews and not doing something for God, then all this talk is vapor. It goes away. Hear that silence? If no one acts on what I just said, then it's gone. It's the same. This is why Jesus takes the sword out of his mouth. His words remain. And they change our lives. He says, upon this Petra, this belief that God, Jesus is God, essentially the son of the living God. He is Messiah and we're going to follow him. Not people, not popes, not pastors, not all this stuff. We're going to follow Jesus, right? When we follow him, I will build my people, my church and the gates Take a look at that picture up there. By the way, Jeff, go ahead and throw that picture up on the side there so they can see it online. You see that Operation of Hell break there? You see the key? You see that key? The gates of what? I know, I say hell, it says Hades. It's, it's very good, I like this in the NIV. They made it sound better. Hades, that sounds somehow better than the other one, right? But the gates of hell, wait, the gate, what? The gates of hell will not, what? Are you awake? What does it say afterwards? Will not, what? Overcome it. Wait a minute. 
Do you see this as a church that is out in the wilderness somewhere hiding away from hell? Or does Jesus say, when you have gates, is that right, in, right next to hell? Or is that a long ways from it? I'm asking you a question. If there's gates, does that mean you're a long ways from hell or near it? Oh, you mean God has called the church to be kind of pushy. To come right to the gates of hell and camp out right there. And in fact, more than that, let's continue to read. Are you ready? The gates of hell. I remember this. By the way, I had a teacher named Richard Fredericks at Columbia Union College, which is now Washington University. And it hit me when he says, think about it. Just like I said, think about it, John. If the gates of hell, if the church won't go up the gates of hell, does that mean the church is away from hell or near it? I was like, uh. He says, the gates of hell. Usually your gate is the gate a long ways from hell or close to it? I was, well, it probably would be right there. Yes, exactly. Our church, unfortunately, we see it as a place to hide out away from this world's pain and suffering when in actuality, my friends, he's called you to that hell because there's people caught behind those gates. And he's going to give us a key. Let's read. The gates of hell will not overcome it, and I will give you the what? The skeleton, the awesome skeleton keys to the kingdom. My friends, when you look at that, there is a keyhole deep in there. Yes, there's a keyhole deep in there. And you can take, that reminds me of Roblox, actually. I kind of like that where the, the key's just hanging there and you grab it. Yeah. You put it in. Yeah, you know about that. And you turn the key, right? My friends, there's people that are in their own hell. People that are in their own personal hells. And the only way they will be unlocked is if you along with the keys in the hand of Jesus, unlock them. But it takes you to have to let them know that you want them to be in the kingdom of heaven. And the key that was given to Jesus by dying on a cross and being raised again is the very keys to the kingdom that unlock their own personal hell opens the door and they can escape breaking the chains of this world off of their wrists and their feet so that they may live can i hear an amen guys i mean seriously if i did not have someone in my life tell me about jesus in a way that i understood i would not be here I know it's a lot of work. Oh, it's a pain in the backside to have to do things for someone other than ourselves. But you know what? Actually, Jesus, when he gives the keys to the kingdom, it is for ourselves. You know why? Because you're unlocking citizens of your country, one that does not have borders, one that does not separate, but one that will bring you together and you have a new brother or a new sister in Jesus. My friends, whether online or on location, I want you to know that if you believe in Jesus and his work, these keys, these keys, the keys that Jesus has are yours to be able to know others 
for him to be able to unlock, to unlock the prison gates so that they may be whole. It's not going to be easy in your life. It never is. Peter had a hard life. But you know what? He died with more joy. Emil, go ahead and bring it down a little bit. There we go. I'm up in the sky. There we go. All right. There we go. Perfect. By the way, you mind holding the keys for me? Thank you. All right. The thing is, is his death and resurrection gave him the ability to hand us keys so that others may have life. Peter went through difficult times in his life, as you and I will, as we reach others. And sometimes people will reject you. But still, keep sharing Jesus. Keep sharing him. Because you will have life. And you will be able to take the crown that Jesus gives you when you get to heaven. You know what you're going to do with it? You're going to throw it down at Jesus' feet. Because on that crown are stars. And each one of those represent people that got to be freed from their own hell to know Jesus. And we're going to take them and throw them at Jesus' feet because he's the one that gave us the key. God bless you all.